Hello and welcome to the Education Redefined webcast series, where I uncover educational best practices and share success stories with every single episode. Go ahead, grab a cup of coffee or your favorite drink and enjoy a few moments talking about teaching and learning with me. Hi, my name is Sandy Alakhanpal and I am your host for this series. Subscribe to our webcast or look out for new episodes on YouTube. Join our Facebook group for the latest trends in the field of education. In this episode of Empowering Students with Dyslexia, I speak with Laura Spates, the Vice President of Family Support and Adult Literacy at Nyhaus Education Center. Laura is a certified academic language therapist and licensed dyslexia therapist. She holds a master's in language and literacy from Howard's Graduate School of Education with a bachelor's in Spanish and English from Texas A&M University. She has over a decade of experience collaborating with and advocating for parents in elementary and secondary public schools as a teacher, reading specialist, and dyslexia therapist. In this episode, Laura talks about issues that students with dyslexia face in schools and offers resources to overcome those issues. Among other things, she talks about recognizing the signs of dyslexia in English language learners, correlations between dyslexia and negative life outcomes, challenges and suggestions to initiate dyslexia diagnosis, adult literacy programs. She also talks about how to advocate for students with dyslexia, parent resources offered by Nyhaus, how to judge the efficacy of reading programs and track progress, the structured literacy approach, and much more. I would encourage you to listen to Laura's episode on engaging and fun summer activities in the 2021 Nyhaus Speaker Series. You can find the link in the show notes below this episode. For the latest news on research and resources, follow Nyhaus Education Center on nyhaus.org. You can also find a link to that in the show notes. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Laura. Hi, Laura. Thank you for joining me for this conversation about Nyhaus. I'm so excited to have you here this morning. Absolutely. Thank you for the invitation. Absolutely. So before we dive into questions and the resources that Nyhaus makes available for parents, um, can you give me a little bit of background about yourself and what drove you to this mission of Nyhaus? Absolutely. So yeah, when I think about why I joined Nyhaus and why I advocate for students who have dyslexia, the first thing I always go back to is the fact that I taught for six years. I got my master's as a reading specialist from Harvard's Graduate School of Education. And in all of that time, I had never been taught how to effectively teach students who had dyslexia. So I was working in middle school, high school setting. I was extremely committed to our students who were struggling readers. I literally got called one time a bulldog when it came to advocating for them. And if you know me, it's kind of funny because I'm fairly introverted and mild mannered. Um, but we were working really hard, both me and my students, and students were struggling year after year. So when I was in grad school, I got to take a class that touched on dyslexia. It didn't tell me how to teach it, but it touched on it. And it piqued my interest because I was like, this is, this is describing the students that have not been making progress with me. Um, and so I'll forever be grateful to the professor, Dr. Kustudalu. She encouraged me to get involved with the local International Dyslexia Association when I returned to Houston. And so I joined the Houston branch and that's when I learned about Night House and I learned, hey, I'm a reading specialist now, but that's just the tip of the iceberg, right? If we're going to effectively serve our students who have dyslexia, we need dyslexia therapists. Right. So I enrolled in the dyslexia therapist preparation program, which as you know, is no joke. <laughs> it requires 200 instructional hours, 700 practicum teaching hours. It took me three years to get certified, longer than my master's. Um, and as I kind of went through that journey and that experience, kind of two real things happened. Um, one is that I saw my middle school students making real and effective growth. Like for the first time, I saw the kind of growth that we had been trying to get happen. Um, but even with that growth, right, if you're coming into middle school four to six years behind in reading, we're still just triaging. It's almost impossible to catch up. Um, so I knew 
right? Like we needed to get to students earlier. We needed those diagnoses to happen earlier. Um, in particular, I worked in a community that had a lot of English learners and that population suffers greatly from a lack of identification because it just gets attributed to saying, oh, you just need to learn more English. That's where this is coming from. Even if they've been in an English classroom since kindergarten for six years now and are still having major problems, um, a lot of times we're not going the route to check, do they actually have dyslexia? Right. Um, the second thing was that I learned a lot more about dyslexia and the correlation with negative life outcomes, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a study of Texas prisons where they gave screeners to inmates and about 50% showed the characteristics of dyslexia. Um, the National Institute of Health, right? They've labeled illiteracy a national public health issue. So receiving the diagnosis, receiving the interventions, I mean, we're talking about your actual life outcome. Right. So Nighthouse led me down this path. I'll be forever grateful for that. Um, and they helped me provide real effective change for my students. And so I was so happy to be able to do that on my campus. And what I noticed was in my community, in the community where I was working, my families didn't know about Night House. Um, in the district that I was working, we didn't necessarily know about Night House. And so when the opportunity came up to join the team and take this amazing information and the amazing resources that Night House has, and actively seek out these communities where I know dyslexia is still being under-identified and work with these within those communities to change that, um, I jumped right in. And so, so now here we are. <laughs> wow, what a wonderful journey. And yes, yeah, spot on. There's, you know, Nye House, uh, to, to my surprise, st still um, is a hidden gem in a lot of, um, a lot of neighborhoods here in te in Texas, in Houston, where Nye House actually lives. So one of the missions is with this podcast is to get the word out is, is you know, to that there is not just Nye House, but Nye House offers so many free resources for parents. And we'll I know we'll dive into that. But piggybacking off of, you know, some of the communities that you have served and you you talked about late identification. There's there's a whole research behind early identification, early intervention. Uh, you know, we catch them early, we give them the resources, the tools to support, and they, they the tendency to grow is much faster, much, you know, with the tools that we are providing. The other thing that you, you kind of alluded to was the research behind, you know, if if students are not reading at grade level by grade three, that's a straight path to the prison system. Um, so talk to me about some of the biggest challenges that parents face before and after diagnosis, or even, you know, identifying that the student needs a diagnosis and, and convincing the school to, to do the testing for the diagnosis. Like what, what happens before during and after, of course, it's a very emotional response once they get diagnosed, but what are some of the challenges that you've seen? No, yeah, that phrase convincing the school is more real than it should be. Yes. Um, I think the biggest challenge that I've seen both as an educator and in working with parents is getting the diagnosis. Um, I'll see teachers and parents where they know something is going on with the child, they know something is going on with the student. They may not be exactly sure what, and if the child is compensating well for dyslexia, you know, say they have a strong memory and vocabulary, right? They can kind of fake it past their classes. Um, then the school might not agree to test the child. And even in some cases, when you have the teacher in support of it as well, right? And dyslexia is on a spectrum. We've got extremely severe to mild. And so some students do need accommodations and intensive interventions and others won't which also means, right, schools have different definitions that they're using or different cutoff points for what they consider qualifying for dyslexia. So I speak regularly with parents who had to work for multiple years before they were able to acquire that diagnosis. Um, it's exhausting. Yes. It's, I, I tell them, you know, often it's a marathon. <laughs> um, it's unfortunate. It shouldn't be that hard because our goal should be to diagnose dyslexia before the child has had the chance to fail at reading. And we have the knowledge to be able to do that now. Um, it's just, we're kind of slow on the on-ramp for doing that for everyone. Right, right. And then one other challenge just that comes to mind is the child's self-esteem, right. right? So part of the definition of dyslexia is having high intelligence and this unexpected difficulty with reading. And so, so often the students are aware, right? They're aware that other kids are getting this reading thing. They aren't. Um, so often I worked a long time with middle schoolers and they were painfully aware 
Um, and it can just bring on incredibly strong feelings of shame that stick with them throughout their life. Uh, we have an adult literacy program at Nye House and we have adult learners. They're learning to read in their 40s, 50s, 60s. And even now they will get emotional when they speak about their school experiences and the shame that they felt um, with not being diagnosed with dy dyslexia and not having support with that. Right, right. Um, and and uh, like you said, it's a marathon, it's not a race, and there's the advocacy piece that comes along with that. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about why is it important for parents to advocate for their children, and how have you steered parents to advocate for their kids? Absolutely. First off, the advocacy piece is because your child needs to know that you believe in them and that you see everything they offer all of their strengths, whether that is art, math, social skills, robotics. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with just some really amazing parents who they ensure that their child has access to the intervention. Absolutely, right? Like we know they need this dyslexia intervention, but they put just as much effort into ensuring that their child has access to things that further their interests, right? So if the kid is interested in robotics, they're gonna get them a kit to make robots or whatever the thing is, right? We want to ensure that the whole child is supported and represented and that they're not just defined by this one area of weakness. And that starts with the parents. Um, I would also just say for any parents, it is so important to stay in communication with the school, right? As a parent, you should absolutely feel empowered to ask what curriculum is being used? How has the interventionist been trained? How and when am I as the parent going to receive progress monitoring reports? Um, you just want to stay in constant communication because if anything needs to change, you want to be aware of that and be able to make that change and not just wait, you know, until the one annual meeting a year. Right, right. And I, and I want to point out that, you know, there are tons of other resources that are available outside of the school system, and that's where Nye House comes in. So um, I know that Nye House offers a plethora of resources for parents. Can you talk to me a little bit about what specifically um, Nye House offers for the parents as well as what they offer, what Nye House offers for kids? Absolutely. So once you have that diagnosis, the most important thing you need to do is if your child needs intervention, you need to get them access to a structured literacy intervention with a trained dyslexia therapist. And so one of our top resources is our dedicated family support coordinators. We have staff, their full-time role is to respond to inquiries that we receive from family members. Um, you can call, you can email in English and Spanish. We get questions from you know, is my child struggling in reading to, we just got a dyslexia diagnosis, what do we do? And we are able to provide referrals to qualified privately employed individuals who can support the child. Um, we also get questions about um, things going on with behavior, mental health. And even though we don't specialize in that, we have connections across Houston, the greater Houston area, really even across Texas um, and beyond, right? If, if someone calls us from somewhere with a question, Either we will give them the resource or we're going to connect them with someone who is going to be able to get them the resource that they need. Awesome. Awesome. And, and from what I understand, you also do a, a number of workshops for parents, right? So talk to me a little bit about what types of workshops you offer and how can parents access those workshops? Absolutely. So, yes. Yeah, so we have a monthly information session. It was created for parents, um, but I would say it's useful for everyone. We have educators who attend, professionals, doctors who want to learn more. Um, we cover the basics of reading and reading difficulties. And then the second half actually goes through the laws and the rights of a child and a family regarding dyslexia in Texas. So it's offered two times a month during the school year on a Wednesday morning and Saturday morning. Um, the registration is on our website. It's always free. I will say it's not recorded um, because it is, we do get into really personal topics. And so you want to make sure when you sign up that you're able to attend. Um, and also in that session, we go through, we have a ton of resources on the website. So frequently asked questions, links to other resources, um, a booklet in English and Spanish that's called You Can Help Your Child. And it just goes through kind of the steps of what you can do book resources, so um, informational books to learn more about dyslexia, and we've compiled a list of books that are kind of middle grade books that you could read with your child, that you can read together, and they touch on, they either have characters who have dyslexia or they touch on the topic, um, so just lots of resources online as well. Awesome, awesome. Um, 
there's also a series called the reading speaker series can you tell me a little bit more about that is that more geared towards parents or teachers yeah it's i would say both um we have i think i want to say it's six sessions coming out and several of them are geared specifically for parents so um, my session is actually coming out next week it's giving ideas for promoting literacy and reading over the summer with your child i will say you know it's over the summer, but it's things that you can do at any point. Um, to give an example, I talk about audiobooks. So why audiobooks absolutely count as reading. We are so pro audiobooks. Um, and then the best places to find them. So different options of where you could find good choices for your child. Um, we have another session for parents that covers read aloud. So modeling how to do them, why to do them, um, and giving examples that parents can then turn around and do with their children. Awesome. Awesome. So several tools for support. Um, you, you talked about a little bit about programs and, you know, the, the kind of structure, structured approach that's successful for students with dyslexia. Now, there are tons of programs in the market that claim that they are aligned to fix dyslexia or they are aligned with the Orton-Gillingham approach. Can you um, talk to me a little bit about, you know, how can parents and teachers judge the efficacy of these programs, like not to blame blindly take somebody a program's word for it is research based it is successful but really critically look at the components of it and say yes this is something that's research based this has been proven to be successful just like Nyhouse is deeply embedded in the Orton Gillingham approach and deeply research based and has been proven to be successful for the last 41 years at this point <laughs> Yes, well said. Um, and I, okay, I'm going to go a little soapboxy here for a second, because absolutely there are people who are promoting programs, interventions, gadgets that have no scientific backing. Um, you know, and if you want to read more about this, if you go to our FAQs, we actually talk through some of them and provide the documentation that shows why they are not accurate. Um, I do have to say the one that bothers me the absolute most is when our parents, we find out that they've gone for expensive vision testing to try to explain dyslexia. Mm -hmm. um, again, the FAQ is going to detail about this and have all of the research backing, but there is no scientific backing for vision testing and dyslexia, right? Those are two completely no separate things. Right. Um, so what I always tell parents is they want a program that aligns with, as you said, Orton Gillingham and structured literacy. So first of all, the program should have a name, right? We're not just making things up willy nilly or deciding like, okay, today we'll focus on this or this. It should have a name and a set curriculum. It should also require some type of certification. So um, to use Nighthouse as an example, our curriculum for dyslexia is called basic language skills. We are accredited by IMSLEC, which I have to check, the International Multisensory Structured Language Education Council. It is a mouthful, but they're the gold standard for dyslexia programs, right? So they accredit other dyslexia programs as well. So again, there are other good programs out there. You just want to ensure they're accredited, ideally by MSLEC. Mm -hmm. um, and then you also want to check that a training is required for the interventionist. So again, the gold standard here is you would want to be working with a certified academic language therapist, also called a cult. Um, in Texas, if you're a cult, you can also get licensed as a licensed dyslexia therapist um, through Texas's certification process. Um, but as I mentioned previously, right, this is very rigorous process. We're talking 200 class hours, 700 practicum hours, book reports, case studies. It took me longer to do this than it did to get my master's. Um, so we have a shortage of certified therapists. But at a minimum, an interventionist has to have some kind of training in the curriculum. And then, of course, always as the parent, you want to know how is progress being monitored and you want to receive that information. So you're seeing that as well. Awesome. Awesome. So keeping tabs with how much growth is taking place. Um, you mentioned the structured approach to equip uh, students with dyslexia. Can you dive a little bit deeper into what is the structured approach and why is it so successful? Yes. Hands down. If your child has dyslexia, if they're struggling with reading, they need a structured literacy approach. So again, our curriculum, basic language skills, this is an example of structured literacy or Gillingham curriculum. Um, and so I guess to understand how it works, you have to you have to understand dyslexia, right? So it's not, you know, I often get people, it's not seeing things backwards, it's not flipping things. Um, the core deficit for our students who have dyslexia is phonological. And so phonological has to do with sounds. Um, so for example, if you'll if you'll indulge me, um, if I say the word bat, repeat bat. Bat. 
Good. Now replace the b sound with m. Mm. Matt. Excellent. So that would be an example, right, of phonological practice. Um, we're thinking about the sounds of the language. You had to identify that first sound, trade it with another, and then blend it together to reach the new word. So our students with dyslexia have trouble saving the sounds in their brain and manipulating those sounds. Additionally, they often have an orthographic deficit. So this has to do with the written and spelling patterns of the language. So for example, um, Okay, let's do this. I'm going to spell a non-word for you, and I want you to tell me your best guess for how you would pronounce it. Okay. M A P E. Mape. Mape. Okay, good. Yes, it's a fake word, but your brain recognizes that the silent e causes the a to say its name. Okay, okay let's try one more. P R H G. Prague. I, no, I'm not sure. Correct. You can't. <laughs> you can't. That is correct. Because um, this word doesn't follow a pattern in the English language. Okay. Right. So, so that's what's happening, right? The, the patterns that, that if you are not dyslexic, you're able to pick up on, it all looks like a non-pattern with PHRG to our students have dyslexia. So, so knowing that the sounds and the patterns aren't saving well in a dyslexic brain, right? They're not just going to pick it up. We have to explicitly and systematically teach those sounds and patterns. Right. Um, so, you know, one of my biggest regrets for my first six years of teaching before I, before I was trained through Nighthouse was that when students would point out a confusing spelling or pronunciation, I would just be like, yeah, guys, you know, English sucks. We're just gonna have to memorize this. <laughs> I did it like every time, right? And then I got trained, right? And we know, thank you, Anna Gillingham, I learned 85% of the English language can be organized into patterns. Right. Only 15% needs to be memorized. So 85% of the time, I can and should teach a student with dyslexia how to logically think through how a word should be read or spelled. Right. So um, to get, you know, when students would then ask me after I was trained, okay, well, wand said, the sounds in wand, it says, Ah, so why am I spelling that with an A? And instead of just being like, okay, English stinks, I can now say, well, that's because when we hear ah after a W, we're gonna use an A, okay. right? So I can give them, I can give them something to hang on to. Right. Um, and just one last thing that I think is important to think about here, right? Is like, this is vital for our students with dyslexia, right? Most of them are not gonna make appropriate progress without it but it is absolutely beneficial for other students as well. So I taught a lot of English learners and they also benefit from being explicitly taught the sounds of the language, especially sounds that don't exist in their first language and for learning the patterns behind spelling. And in general, right, this idea that like most students are just gonna pick up reading, that's also false. The majority of students need some type of direct instruction. The intensity is gonna differ um, and being able to do structured literacy essentially levels the playing field for everybody and gives them all this like deeper knowledge and understanding of the why behind our behind the English language. Right, right. So well said that this is uh, this is not just an approach for those with reading disabilities or dyslexia. It's universally successful. Now, of course, the, the ones who don't have the struggles of dyslexia will, will probably jump off and become readers much faster than those who struggle with it might need those extra um, training wheels for for a little bit longer till they get there but they'll eventually make it there which is the good part of the structured approach now um throw in the mix of of the pandemic right <laughs> if we, yeah. we are already sitting in a classroom where these children are struggling right and now with the pandemic everything had to change and go virtual um tell me a little bit about you know all of our teachers had to pivot in the spur of the moment. They had to re-engineer their curriculum. How did Nyhouse re-engineer their approach to serve parents during this pandemic? Yeah, I mean, we took our services virtual, right? So in a lot of ways, it's been really great. Prior, prior to the pandemic, right, our information sessions were held in our building. Um, so people had to travel up there. Children weren't able to join. So if you had children, you needed childcare. Um, and so if you couldn't make it, you just didn't join. And now our sessions are offered still free, but virtually. So we get people from Houston, outside of Houston. We even have people from other states who have found us just looking for information for how they can support their child. Um, and so they find us and join, and then we're usually able to get them connected with their own local resources. Um, and the other thing that I just think has been kind of interesting 
because of the pandemic, a lot of parents got to see firsthand how their child was learning, right? And so we've had lots of parents contact us saying like, they saw it firsthand and that's what caused them to realize like, hey, there is something else going on here and we need to seek out additional supports. Right. Um, so that I actually, and I know it was really difficult for a lot of parents, but I think it's also helped them to get, to get supports for their child if right. needed. Right, it's a blessing in disguise. Um, so with your, your background in teaching as a reading specialist, dyslexia for years, and now as a parent advocate for Nyhaus, where do you see Nyhaus going next, especially in this virtual learning environment? Like, what does the path ahead look like? Yeah, that's a great question. So I guess in terms of just kind of the post-pandemic question, right, we hope to kind of keep a blend of in-person and virtual, right? You know, I'm kind of excited to have some things in person because you just have more opportunities to talk, get to know people. Right? It's kind of hard to on a Zoom call, you know, right. um, but also like I'm so happy that we've been able to reach outside of the greater Houston area and support parents from all over. And that's something that we absolutely want to continue doing. Um, locally, we're really committed and actively working on reaching out to schools to foster partnerships to support families. So again, especially in communities where we know students are underdiagnosed with dyslexia, we want to reach out and partner with the school with the idea of, again, if, if families feel comfortable with the educators in their school and helping to make that bridge so that we can spread this information and again, get it out there about all the resources that are available. Um, and let parents know what the look for's are so that we can contribute to making sure that we don't end up with what I experienced my 10 years in a school where I would get sixth graders who couldn't read. Right. Um, that's, that's what we want. We want that to stop. Right, right. What a wonderful mission. Lara, it's been a pleasure hosting you today. Thank you for taking the time to speak with me and my listeners. Thank you so much. So happy to do it. Thank you for listening to this episode of Education Redefined. We welcome feedback. Join our Facebook group to leave a comment or a question. We look forward to hearing from you. Until then, stay tuned for our next episode.